Hi everyone, it's Jerry. I have an excellent game to share with you from the 1996 European Club Cup on the white end, Boris Gelfand. And he's playing against Vladimir Kramnik. This one has one of the most beautiful finishes to a game. You'll see a very nice final move by Kramnik. And I think it's this finish to the game that can easily overshadow the positional components that surface throughout the opening and middle game phases. It's this early positional struggle that sets the stage for the beautiful finish. It's a 28 move game, very high level play by both sides. Primarily, uh, mostly Kramnik's play is exceptional, as you'll see when I share the tail of the tape, very high accuracy. Of Kramnik's final 12 moves, 11 of them are the top line by Stockfish. Now, this positional struggle I speak of, I'm going to give you one piece to pay close attention to throughout this game, and that is Kramnik's King Knight. Take note of the great care it's given throughout. On board, we have a Slav defense. e6 now signals the semi Slav. e3, knight bd7, and queen c2. This is noted as the Stoltz variation. Gelfand is staying clear of the mainline Mirren variation. Mainline Mirren would run with bishop d3 after the bishop has moved, take on c4, and then look to play on the queen side a few ways to continue from here. This is a very sharp line. In playing queen c2, we can say the king bishop remains uncommitted for at least another move. White is saying if you do want to Release the tension, I'm happy to recapture in one go. And in these lines, I prefer having my queen on c2 rather than home base. Black has no interest in capturing on c4. Continues to develop. Bishop d6, where it supports an e5 pawn break. And now in comes g4. This is noted as the Shabalov attack. Before I share anything more, I'm going to throw a pop quiz your way and ask, how would you reply to White's last move? Feel free to pause the video and think about it for a little bit. Okay, I'd like to devote some time to this moment in the game. It's important. There are a few ways you could be replying to White's last move. First of all, when is this move played exactly? It's played when the King Bishop has been developed. Or in other words, as soon as the g7 pawn is unprotected. So one of the options black has is to take the pawn. Another is to play h6. Another is to take on c4. What does Kramnik play? We're going to see soon enough. Let me touch on these moves. If you're taking on g4, certainly things are opening up on the king side. This is one of the lines you may see. Kingside castles probably not going to be happening in this game for black with the g-pawns, uh, with there not being a g-pawn around. Very dynamic play from there. Another h6, what's that doing? Stabilizing the king knight for another move or two. At the same time, do know that castling kingside is a little bit risky as well in these situations with the pawn on h6. This can act as a hook. So it may take a little bit more time for white to prep uh, a pawn advance to g5, but when it does hit, it's going to hit that much harder, and a file will be cracked open. That third move, capturing on c4. What is black saying? I'm giving up my biggest pawn, my strongest pawn, in order to vacate d5 for my king knight. So in the event of g5, the knight goes to the center. Now. If your mentality in this position was to ignore White's last move and just carry on with castles, that's not a good mentality to have. And here's why. After g5, your knight has to go to a square it doesn't like. It doesn't like e8. It's not productive there. No wonderful prospects to enter back into play. And if you go to h5, I must admit that sometimes this could be an effective post for the knight. Sometimes it does a good job in stopping this pawn from getting to h5. And if the pawn can't get to h5, there's pretty much not going to be a pawn break. It could be effective in stopping pawn breaks. However, 
Posted it on h5 in this situation is not good for two reasons. One, it's not stable. There's a light square bishop still around that could question it. And two, it lacks a clear path back towards the center. It doesn't have access to, for example, the f4 square. Uh, it has no good squares at the moment. And if you're thinking, well, I could create a path with g6, fianchetto the knight, hop into f5, that is too far-fetched and too weakening, especially with still all pieces on board to create these giant gaps on h6 and f6. That's not a good way to go. So, some care needs to be taken over this king knight immediately, as soon as g4 is on board. What is Kramnik's choice? Take the knight, or excuse me, take the pawn, h6, or c4. His choice, none of the above. This is not considered a best move, but it is certainly playable. With bishop to g4, what is Kramnik saying? Maybe one of the first things he's saying is, I don't want to give up my strongest pawn on d5. You know, I'm not, not going to go with d takes c4. I am also prepared to give up my good bishop for a knight. This is always one of those proceed with caution type ideas. You could be, in this case, black could be especially vulnerable on the dark squares. And another point in playing bishop to b4, Kramnik saying, I still want to keep my king side as a safe haven for my king. I'm not going to move any of these pawns. I'm not going to allow the king side to be opened up so easily. Okay. Now, in playing bishop to b4, what is black prepared to do? As mentioned, he's prepared to give up bishop for knight. What is being accomplished with this? Well, you're eliminating a defender of e4 so that the king knight can make use of that square right now. You know, I didn't point this out, but after castles here, we can't hop into the center. We don't have enough support for that. So he's trying to eliminate a key defender of e4 for the king knight. From here we have bishop to d2, queen e7, and now in comes a3. Bishop takes knight, bishop takes bishop. Now, at the end of the game when I share the tail of the tape, this a3 move does not register as a mistake, nor does it register as an inaccuracy. It is a more minute error. Considered better is g5. Both a3 and g5 in this position are provoking bishop takes knight. And it is better to get in g5. g5, we could say, is more consistent. You play g4 to play g5 to scare the knight or maybe more so just take over control of f6 from additional pieces. And g5 is also less weakening in a way. In playing a3, you know, when you're playing the Shabalov attack with g4, your intention is to castle a queenside. It is better for white to keep, keep these pawns on b2 and a2. So there's even, you know, ideas to continue rushing down with h4, h5, g6. So g5 is more consistent on this move 9, a little bit better than a6. This is where it now sort of turns evenish in playing a3 rather than g5. Okay, bishop takes knight follows. Bishop takes bishop. And this is the first moment where black is now on move and is having to deal with an unopposed dark square bishop. So what does he go with? Not castles. He goes with b6, immediately looking to control dark squares. Black already has in mind not just the bishop development to b7 or a6, but he's staying strong on c5. So if the bishop tries to go elsewhere, be irritating to the queen, stop castles, there's now a good reply in c5. Okay. From here, bishop d3. e4 is no longer an option. g5 right around the corner. What is Kramnik going to do? 
how to react to this. His play, bishop a6. A move played on the queen side is having an influence on this center square, e4. Black is prepared to distract one of these pieces from observing e4 because of this pressure on c4. Now, the move played in the game is queen a4. If the knight is attacked, how can black reply? By capturing on c4. It's turning out that in, in this line, black's d-pawn would be hungrier than white's g-pawn. There's more, more stuff in the black uh, in the in the black pawn's way. So how might this go? Chop on c4, f6, something like this. Black's for choice. It's up a pawn. Both of these probably end up getting picked up, but black is up a pawn in this position. Doing very well. There is no g5 here. Bishop a6 is met with queen a4. So already this move has had an influence on that king knight had an influence on the e4 square. It's pulling the queen away from watching over e4 indirectly. The reply here, a couple of different ways you could take on c4. Kramnik goes with the better. d takes c4. If you're capturing with the bishop on c4, this is not good, because after bishop takes, pawn takes, there's queen takes c6, and black's reaction must now be a strictly defensive one. There is a threat on the rook. Considered best is queen to d8. That is very awkward. If you simply castle connecting rooks, remember that unopposed bishop? It strikes. That's a problem. This is winning for white. What is the difference in capturing on c uh, capturing on c4 with the pawn rather than the bishop? Well, if let's say queen takes c6 in this position, the bishop is still around. And now there's a nice counterattack to the threat against the rook. Rook c8. White is forced back, and white in this position now has to make a strictly defensive move. Black has, with this sequence, bought himself some time to uh, make a productive move. So the bishop is hit, the knight is hit, White has to fall back like this. And you may find it interesting to note uh, in this position, the top two moves by black are knight d5 and a5. What is similar uh, with these two moves? Well, or what is common with these two moves? They are taking into account the unopposed dark square bishop. They're watching over this bishop to b4 move. Okay. Kramnik takes with the pawn. That is the better capture. Queen takes bishop. Pawn takes bishop. Queen takes pawn. And finally, Kramnik's ready to castle. From here, g5. Where do we go? Go to the edge, go to the center. We go to the center. Still not good to go to the edge. There isn't a light square bishop around. But where is that clear path back towards the center? It still isn't there. Okay, on board knight d5. If the knight is given a kick, it's going to take the bishop, so bishop d2 first. Nearby is e4. What is Kramnik going to do about the knight after e4? Now, I should note, I've been drawing a lot of attention to this knight jump onto that h5 square. Suppose, instead of playing g5 straight away, what if white played e4? And then after c5, let's say, went with g5. Is now an okay time to go to h5? Yes. So I want to highlight this because now this is an effective square for the knight. Why? There isn't a, a bishop around that can question it. And it now has a clear path back towards the center. f4 is available. There isn't a convenient defender of f4. A pawn would be a convenient defender. Okay. In the game, we have g5, knight d5, bishop d2. Moments away, the knight's going to be questioned, but Kramnik, of course, alert to that. 
he plays f5, looking to stabilize the knight, and it will, in this game, remain stable. It took a lot of effort. We're 16 moves in. This pawn will be around to watch out for e4. Black's ready to take on e4 if that's on board. And the knight will stay there. Notice, this is a losing move for white, taking on f6 on Passan. Because after queen takes, there's a big problem on the f-file. Now, at first glance, I thought white is either going to lose a piece straight away, or black's going to be capturing on f2 with check, and white's going to be dead. I found a, a fun little line I'd like to highlight here. There is e4 kicking the knight, defending the knight once. White could continue like this to save the knight, but there's always these tricks. We got knights around and the white king is still in the center. Here's one fun way you could end up winning some material. Queen takes knight is a nice tactical shot at this stage. Queen takes queen, knight d4. Black wins a piece. Okay. F5. Capturing an F6 is losing for white, so queenside castles. Where to go from here? Well, opposite sides castling. Let's try and open up some lines. The king is on the C file. So let's try and get rid of the C pawn. C5 on board. King B1. Very natural. Ready to get the rook on the C file. Pop quiz. Can you spot Kramnik's next move? As mentioned at the start of the video, Kramnik was hitting, you know, 11 of his remaining 12 moves of this game. Top line by Stockfish. This next one is a top one. Can you spot it? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, best move. B5. Very, very nice move. Um... Some note you may want to make to yourself in positions like these right here. As soon as, if you're playing as black, let's say, and your opponent goes queenside castles, here's one quick note you could say to yourself. We have opposite sides castling. Another note, my opponent's king is on the queen side. And when my opponent's king is on the queen side, there is a pawn of mine that is expendable. If your opponent's king is on the queen side, your queen knight pawn is a pawn I like to consider expendable. So it's the B pawn in this case that you would really prefer to not have on the board. And the reason for that is because without that guy around, black has the potential to stack the rooks on the B file where it aims right at the heart of the enemy king position. It is a very small pawn, uh, a very small investment. And, you know, you're giving up one point in playing b5. It is captured in this case. You're giving up one point in order to activate 10 points towards the enemy king. That's a, that's a good investment. Material, not a big deal very often in these opposite sides castles positions. So this is how the game followed. The queen, the queen picked up the b-pawn. Some other options, like, I don't know, capturing this pawn in this position, not good either. Improving a 7th ranked knight. It's improved two ranks with force, generating a threat. These are monsters. If this pawn is not captured in this position, let's say white carries on with play on the king side. Now comes c4, and here, here's how quickly things could just be smashed open. There's already c3. Here comes b4. This is not savable for white. The position is now broken open on the queen side, and there's no guarantee any of these moves are getting white anywhere. There's no guarantee of an open file. h6, g6. Uh, excuse me, g6, h6, and h6, g6. It's locked up. Files won't open up. So, it's going to be a tall task ahead for white to try and defend this position. He ends up taking the pawn. 
In comes rook a b8, queen a5. This is the only suboptimal move Kramnik makes, uh, Kramnik makes for the remainder of the game. Hard to argue with it though, it seems perfectly natural. He goes as deep as he can with the rook to a gap right here. It is a hole on b3, observing two pawns, pinning a pawn to a knight. It's unprotected on f3. Considered better is one of the better moves is rook b6 or c4 even, where this this pawn looks to be uh, become a battering ram. I guess in a way you're stopping this knight from ever making use of d4. But, okay, c4 was considered one of the better moves here, but who could argue with rook to b3? From here, king to a2. Very natural looking type move. You know, you're getting out of a pin. You're watching over both of these pawns. Maybe there's some fancy capture on a3. The king is watching over that a little bit more. Um, it is not considered best, though. Best is king a1. So why maybe not go to a2? This feels very natural to me. So I had a, you know, I just kind of questioned my own mentality here. In playing king to a2, yes, you're out of the pin. You're threatening the rook, but it's not an inconvenience. It's not as if when you play king to a2, it's an inconvenience to black. Black's going to double the rooks anyway, so there's really no, uh, you know, black is an inconvenience by stacking the rooks next. The more I looked at it, I thought, oh, you know what? When you're on a1, yes, you're out of the pin. And now there's only two poss there's only one check in the position. That's that's the way I looked at it. There's only one check. Rook takes a3. Not saying it's a great move, but one check compared to four checks. One, two, three, four. Maybe it's better to go to a square where you could only be checked once. However weird the check may seem. You never know how the position is going to evolve and the complications that may arise. So, okay, in this game, it's king a2. Black doubles the rooks. It's not fun, but <laughs> white has to babysit the v-pawn somehow. Rook b1. And now in comes e5. Very strong move, best move. Uh, the only move, I believe, that wins is e5 clearing the way for queen e6, trying to get on this diagonal. Rook h, c1, queen e6 it is, setting up discoveries. So th this rocks the king back to a1. Um, you may find it interesting, you know, why are we going to e6 rather than f7? Well, from f7, you're not stable. You could be hit with g6. If you're capturing, there's knight g5. So there's some irritating moves if your queen is on f7 rather than the more central and stable e6. From here, king a1. And now how to capture on d4. Do we follow the general rule of taking towards the center? Not in this case. We go with e takes d4. We have a reason to stay away from the general rule. It's a very computerish line. I'd like to highlight it. If you're capturing towards the center, there's some deep line with g6, h6, cutting that out, and now queen to a4. And now all of a sudden, let's say after this move, there's this idea where this rook could pivot on c6 and distract the queen, kick her off of this diagonal. It's a, it's a bit of a loose position all of a sudden for black. It's considered even. Okay, it's a very computer-esque uh, line right there. You don't really have to see that line, I don't believe, though, in playing black's next move. Black can say to himself, I have a good reason to not go with the general rule of taking towards the center. Notice what's happening if you're taking towards the center. You could just look at it from a numbers standpoint. Look at the new options you would be giving the white pieces when you're taking towards the center. The queen now has access to d5. That's an additional legal move. And also, this rook has access to c6, c7, c8. Maybe there's some lines. I can't share a line with you, but 
in some other type of position, maybe landing a key check, distracting this B8 rook from the B file is something. Those options aren't available to white when you're taking with the E pawn. Anyhow, important to note that there is a, a nice exception to this general rule in this case. It has to do with the mobility of the white pieces, not extending, uh, not increasing the mobility of the white pieces. Okay. From here, it's rook takes c5. Hard to suggest something at this stage for white. He's trying to knock out the defender of d4 so that there's this fork that can land, but this one's over for white. And it finishes in a beautiful way, as mentioned at the start. Rook takes pawn. Knight takes rook. Black's up a rook. There's no time to land the fork now. Because we could just duck. Offer a queen exchange. Black's up the rook. So first is queen takes knight. And now, here we go. Remember the great care that Kramnik has given this king knight in the middle game, uh, opening and middle game. Now it drops an absolute bomb on the position. Took quite a, wor quite a lot of work for this, but knight c3 lands. This is a big intersection square, clearing the way for some queen a2 idea. A lot of different mating ideas for black at this stage. How to react to this, there really isn't a, a good way. Um, if you're capturing with the bishop, you're inviting another pawn into the mix. B2 is going to collapse. So let's have a look at this line, actually. If now knight to d4, you could take on b2. Rook takes b2. And in this line, you could afford to give up your queen. Here's one of the fun ways this one could go straight to mate. That's pretty. Okay. Move played in the game is not bishop takes knight, but knight takes d4, landing the fork. In comes rook takes b2. Very nice. You could afford to give up the queen. There are two different mates on a2. So knight takes queen. We have this mate. Or even just rook takes b rook takes b1. Move played in the game. The rook takes b2. I should mention... <laughs> Uh, there's this funny move in this position as white instead of taking on b2. If you play queen f8, you can't capture with the king. White would end up winning. You don't want to lose your queen with check. <laughs> so, you know, if this flashy move was on board by Gelfand on this move 28, you would take with the rook and be winning. Anyhow, funny spite check, I guess we could say. In the game, it's rook takes b2, and one final move to this one. Can you spot it? What is Kramnik's last move of this game? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, here we go. Queen a2, and white resigns. Very flashy finish. There's only one legal move. Rook takes queen would run into rook b1 for me. That king knight is amazing. It took a lot of work, but the positional ideas are what led up to this tactical finish and uh, definitely a beautiful finish to this 28 mover. Anyhow, let's have a look at the tail of the tape on this one. We could see the level of play super high and 86 and 86 for Gelfan, 97 for Kramnik. Uh, very nice game, very instructive game. I've been staring at this one for several hours now, and I feel I uh, grew somewhat as a player in uh, reviewing this one game. So anyhow, as usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below. Hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.